lobbying recommendation. We have a number of public comments and um, perhaps more public comments. Allow me to take a moment while I organize to say this was an enormous undertaking by the staff. And um, I speak for myself and I think the rest of the commissioners when I say we understand that amount of time and effort that goes into this and to uh, continuing the conversation with us on these issues. And these are difficult issues. We're having to make policy decisions. We're having to make legal decisions. And um, I know that you have been living this for a number of months and that, in fact, you've been living this before <coughs> many of us were even on the commission. And so thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for your work and for presenting it in a way that um, is frankly very user friendly. So I think that we should take the uh, public comment first as we usually do. Um, Mr. Phillips? Welcome to the Ethics Commission. Thank you. Two minutes? Um, so my name is Jane Phillips. Uh, I'm the Director of Public Policy with Central City Association. Um, yesterday we submitted a joint letter along with the LA Area Chamber of Commerce and uh, with the Valley Industry Commerce Association and, and before anything else we just want to reiterate our key message from that and I'm speaking on behalf of the Central City Association here but our chief goal here is compliance um, and we don't want to thwart that in any way. Um, in our letter, we identified three main concerns with the proposed policy and a few general themes to address. I don't think I'll be able to get through all of this in two minutes, but I'll just say that probably the most important of those themes is our belief that any updates to the lobbying ordinance should meet a few key standards. First, that they promote the communication of useful information to the public. Uh, and second, that they focus on ensuring compliance rather than creating obstacles to legal and valid lobbying activities. And another <coughs> thing, um, is that we feel like we need more clarity on what problem or shortcoming each rule change is intended to solve. Um, in our letter, we do identify the three chief concerns for us, which are the change to requiring each uh, job title and date of contact, um, opening up the allowing lawsuits by private citizens and um, reducing the filing deadlines. I think other people will probably cover those in more details. Uh, but I'll just say that as the letter from Sutton Law Firm detailed, uh, we do think there is a need to update the municipal lobbying ordinance and welcome changes that balance the public's right to information with a reasonable assignment of responsibility to lobbyists and lobbyist employers. Um, we don't believe this package of rules strikes that balance appropriately at this time, and we hope that going forward the commission will engage with our organizations uh, so that our voices can be heard in this process. Thank you. Um. Sorry, one second. Yeah. You said three, uh, job title and date of contact. I have that as number one. Number three yes. is reducing filing deadlines, and number two is? Two is uh, the opening of the private uh, law lawsuits by private citizens, okay. yeah. And three was the reducing the filing deadlines. Okay. Thank you very much yeah. for being here. Mr. Nichols? address this item. We unfortunately didn't have time to submit written comment, um, but I want to express a few of the items that Shane already touched on, um, so I'll keep them quick. Um, I too much. Um, but I think what we saw is we, we understand what this recommendation is trying to do, and we appreciate it. I think it's important to have a um, fully informed public. That's the, the purpose of the MLO. Um, but we think also that from a practical standpoint, this you may not strike the right balance, um, given the burden it will place on practitioners. Um, Wine is a large lobbying firm, and we are already pressed to meet the current deadline um, at the end of the, the reporting period. And to reduce that to, I think, 10 days is a proposed amount, so would be extremely burdensome. And uh, just given the number of clients and the amount of lobby activity, I know it would be personally doing other firms as well. That is a very tight window. 
Um, that coupled with the increased requirements to report exact dates, job titles, um, and other information that would be added as part of the recommendation, uh, that just compounds that, that burden on us. And I think the uh, current lobbying requirements um, in place do provide adequate information to the public. Um, to, uh, to add further requirements would, would make reporting extremely difficult, if, if not impossible, to, to keep track of the job titles of everyone you within every meeting, exact dates. I think this would open up that the window of that private private attorney general provision. Um, I think large lobbying firms, all lobbyists would be susceptible to uh, uh, not being full compliance with the end time. be overly burdensome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Aaron Green. I am the. We, we're not accustomed to that level. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we're all we're all thrown right now. <laughs> uh, my name is Aaron Green. I am the president of the Afria Consulting Group. We are a political consultancy that's been in business in Los Angeles since 1985. I have been with the firm for eight years. I also have experience. I've worked at the Valley Industry and Commerce Association. So I've worked both with lobbyist employers as well as the lobbying firm. Um, this is a tremendous undertaking by staff, and we very much appreciate that there's a lot of attention focused on transparency. I think everybody that you see in the room is a registered lobbyist today who's very akin to and familiar with extensive transparency. Um, I'm a firm bay people. We don't have an ethics compliance officer. The same guy that does our accounts receivable does our ethics reporting, our office management, a whole host of things. We spend thousands of dollars every quarter on reporting, and I think some of the new requirements would add at least $10,000 to reporting every time we have to do a report. I would like to focus the majority of my comments on the requirement to report every title, contact, subject, date, things like that. Um, I think while well-intentioned, this is actually gonna have the opposite intent. Um, what it does for those of us who are law-abiding is it creates opportunities to make administrative mistakes. We have conversations all day, every day, and it's very easy to forget as you walk down the hall and somebody says, hey, how's that project going? It's going well, and to forget that. Um, but what this does, and, and you know, that creates an opportunity for us to forget to file the note of the conversation, the date, the time, things like that. But what it also does is it discourages participation in the formal lobbying practice. It makes it more expensive and harder and discourages people who aren't registered lobbyists from becoming registered lobbyists. You know, in this building right now, I'm sure you've got a half dozen unregistered lobbyists, some of them have been operating for years. There are probably 50 to 100 unregistered lobbyists in the city. And there's almost never a conversation about how do we bring those people into the folds. I think that this policy would strongly discourage those people from coming into the folds because it's saying it's going to be so much harder to participate in the practice, so much more expensive. I think we should focus on bringing in unregistered lobbyists as opposed to making an undue burden on those of us who are law abiding. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Englinger. Good morning. I am Adam Englinger. I am a partner and general counsel for Englinger, Konami, and Allen, a lobbying firm based here in Los Angeles. Um, I just want to talk again. Everything that uh, Mr. Sutton and Mr. Green and everybody else has said, you know, applies to all of us. Um, coming up, she's running a little bit late as our administrative uh, manager who really controlled all final and law reports, not just here in the city of Los Angeles, but the county of Los Angeles, the metro, city of Long Beach, city of Santa Monica, all which have very similar requirements and all which generally, you know, happen on a quarterly basis. By doing this to a two month basis with reports having 10 days after puts a terrible administrative burden that, again, hopefully she'll show up in time to be able to tell you about. But it really makes her job a lot more difficult to get, especially if you start having to track who met with whom when and whatnot. Uh, one thing also as general counsel that I want to go talk about is the private jury, attorney general thing that allows people to go and um, follow their own litigation and be able to go and recover 
you know, situations like this in front of Attorney General will mean that we will be in court pretty much every day. You know, anybody that is around here is going to go, they're going to go and sue, and again, and that means if somebody goes and marks down based on these new rules, if they meet somebody on a Tuesday but they really know them on a Wednesday, therefore we'd be subject to all sorts of various litigation just because somebody happened to go see us that day. Again, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Those are reporting requirements, remembering who calls you when, who texts you when, when you get an email, when you run into somebody at City Hall. You know, if any of us are sitting here and we attend a city council meeting on behalf of one of our clients and we have to run into 20 or 30 people that we happen to know, we have to list down every single person at the exact time and what it is and what happened. So, you know, for all of these sort of various reasons, I think a lot of these things need more consideration going back and talking to really people within the industry in terms of creating new rules that, again, I think all of us support. And I think um, Andrew made a very good point about bringing in those unregistered lobbyists. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Burkhoff. Good morning. Uh, Arnie Burkhoff, president of Arnie Burkhoff Associates. We've been a lobbying firm uh, since 1998, so almost our 20th anniversary. I, I, I'm not going to read, I'm going to do what I tell my clients and I'll repeat what the previous speaker said. Uh, but I, I, let me comment a little bit about this the second. new and different for us. We're getting respect. There you go. There you go. You'll see what we say in the back of the room. Uh, what I, what no, I, I, I can read lips. So there, there, there you go. There you go. <laughs> what, what I would like to do is talk just for a second about the whole idea of reporting um, who you meet with, time you meet with them, all of that stuff. It, it's ridiculous, and I think that's probably a legal term. Um, it, it's kind of, I remember a while back the commission came up with a great idea that we should all wear badges, and we called it the Scarlet Letter. And uh, I'm not sure what the point of that was, and it, it actually never uh, came to fruition. I think this falls in that exactly the same category. It's virtually impossible, just walking up here this morning, I probably bumped into and said hello to 15 different people. And I probably said almost every lobbyist in the room. And I'd probably spend more time logging in than I would um, eating lunch or anything else during the day. Um, I represent a company called Taser that uh, has uh, uh, sold body cameras to LAPD. Uh, we're working on the sheriffs right now. So I have a great idea. Why don't we all wear body cameras and you guys, staff, can, can look at all of the tapes every day and see who we met with and what we said and has time sensitive on it and date stamps. Uh, being a little facetious, but I think that everyone here is open, it is for open and transparency, but some of these issues uh, or take, taking a little bit too far. And as, as having been a lobbyist for 20 years, I think I'm getting a little bit tired of always being the presumption that we're doing something wrong because we're not. We're providing really good service to the city. Thank you. Thank you. The body camera issue, do we want to have a privacy discussion <laughs> now or later? <laughs> later. Okay. later. Um, Mr. Previn. Good morning, it is Eric Riven from CD2. I'm a resident, sometime candidate, a journalist, uh, and a watchdog. And Liner, this, this particular month, disclosed nicely 1 million and 19,000, and Mr. Englander's group are a little under a million and 966,000 for the last quarter. These guys are doing a lot of big business, and I understand that the changes that you made might impact their bottom line. And I agree that uh, there seems to be an effort to uh, micromanage, in a way, uh, a problem that is a significant problem, but is not going to be micromanaged. The, the piece that Mr. Sanchez, the brave Mr. Sanchez, the last page, he worked for uh, one of the lobbyists, I think Mr. Hafferty's group, uh, Aaron Green was here, he's our sportsman lobbyist, uh, and he's also been a lobbyist at Weddington in my district, so we're very familiar with these guys' work. But Mr. Sanchez brought up a point, which is that they, these poor lobbyists are being forced by elected officials, is what they claim, to bundle in campaign contributions. Now, while we're all dazzling one another about whether they met on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, how about Mr. Berghoff does not agree to put checks in his briefcase and bring them to campaign uh, accounts? Because when all these guys do it, it's appalling, because we are right in the zone of seeking client favors. So to be helping out various political donors 
who are related to those companies. I think everybody read Emily Alper Ray's article about the, and David Tong Ray's article about the secret. This is exactly what we're trying to limit. So by providing a consultant's consult, I have no problem with him coming in and saying, look, Xerox should not pay the cost of litigation that the city is going to endure because you said we could do it. And that's their job. It's horrible, and the city officials are appalling for agreeing to those terms, but someone other than the city should pay those bills. And Mr. Mr. Berghoff and all the various lobbyists um, should not systematically be providing campaign contributions and having little uh, election parties and various things, and then agree to take back $100 like that other crazy article as if we're focusing on something that's meaningful, a party for some older lobbyist, and then Marquise Harris Dawson showed up and forgot to give $100. This is absolute nonsense. So the lobbyists should disclose what they're doing reasonably, and they should not agree to muddy the water with campaign contributions, which they all do. It's disgusting. You can look at it at uh, Mr. Lowe's work of cupping, cupping down those uh, various bundling. Bundling is the enemy of the people. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sutton? Jim Saki. Now you're trying to make us laugh. <laughs> they they laugh. Um, I am here on behalf of the Los Angeles Lobbies Association. Um, several of our members have already testified. I think there's others who will. Um, it's, it's a trade association of the local public affairs consulting law firms, lobbying firms. And it's been mentioned, these are the people who comply with the law. These are the people who believe in transparency and who really want to work with the commission on kind of getting these rules right. So I'm gonna make one comment at the beginning and I apologize if it's a little bit on a high horse, but I think it's really important and it was not in the staff report. And that is what you're talking about today implicates First Amendment rights, the right to petition the government for the redress of grievances. So the question is not just, oh, would this information be interesting? Oh, is some other jurisdiction asking this question on lobby reports? The question is, is there a underlying public policy reason why you have to impose this burden on lobbying firms to gather this information. And I think that that analysis is really important to the, the comments that have been talked about today. Um, so a lot of our specific comments are outlined in the letter that we, were, that we submitted, and we look forward, we look forward to talking with you in more detail about any of those issues. So the only thing that I want to say that maybe hasn't been said is that this process, oh, and by the way, ARM is in a great job. And, and the definition sections, the exemption section, the consistency sections, listening to me on the phone, I really do appreciate his hard work. Um, it's been great. But there's an opportunity here to really update the reporting requirements. And 99% of the reporting requirements have stayed the same in this law. And what we point out in our letter is there's a lot of questions on the LA City lobbying reports are the longest reports in the state. And there's questions like, how much do lobbying firms pay their employees? Giving copies of fundraising solicitations, behested donations, that frankly, a, most lobbying firms are not necessarily even answering. And I think a, a, a working group, an interested persons meeting, where we can really kind of struggle through these issues, figure out what's the public policy reason behind these questions, um, I, I want to offer the Lobbyist Association and their members to the commission to really help improve and update all these reporting requirements so that the public is getting the most infor useful information they can. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sutton. Mr. Hertz. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Brad Hertz, a partner of the Sutton Law Firm, also here on behalf of the Los Angeles Lobbying Association. And I'd like to focus my comments on process and procedure. First, with a compliment to Armand Tarzi for the hard work that he's put in 
uh, but also to ask for um, more opportunity for input. Uh, as you may know, the Fair Political Practices Commission has interested persons meetings uh, in person as well as via telephone early on in the process and then throughout the process when they're looking at new regulations or amendments. Uh, there was certainly opportunity for input, but it was a bit of a moving target in the sense that it started very generally with a request for overall comments and then ended only this past Thursday when we finally got the red line version of the language, the staff report, uh, and, and that was the most helpful, meaningful information because then our members and we could really focus in. So I know that the law sometimes is a moving target, but if uh, the regulated community could be brought in earlier and more kind of actively and look at each reason for each amendment, I think that would be helpful. And one aspect of that, I think, is the more input you get earlier on from the regulated community, as we've been hearing today, we may be able to kind of get to the sweet spot of, of a good uh, measure that strikes the balance. Um, and one example is the 10-day turnaround, which really does not seem to meet the real-world practicalities of gathering information and doing accurate and complete reporting. Uh, our letter, which we apologize that it was yesterday when we were able to turn it in, but it does spell out uh, quite a few additional points, and we look forward to continuing working on these amendments with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ritz. Ms. Subramania. Mr. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Can you? Uh, sure, Subramanian. Uh, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to comment. I just want to echo other comments that have been made, um, thanking staff for their thoughtful consideration of the Los Angeles Municipal Lobby Ordinance and its effect on the regulated community, um, and from our perspective, especially uh, 51C3 organizations. My name is Sham Subramanian. I'm Southern California Council with Alliance for Justice. And through our Boulder Advocacy Program, we provide trainings and technical assistance to nonprofit organizations around the legal rules of nonprofit advocacy. Um, so, I'd like to speak about the uh, 51C, the proposed 51C3 exemption. And we also share other commenters' um, interest in meaningful and useful lobbying disclosure. And we think that that does need to be balanced with um, the burden on the regulated community. And we believe the proposed 51C3 exemption, and I just want to say a few points, but we did submit written comments. We believe the proposed 51C3 exemption does not strike the right balance, first, because of the burdens of compliance that it would impose, especially on 51C3 organizations, smaller 51C3 organizations that may not be able to hire a firm to file reports or establish these record keeping systems, and also, um, you know, that would not be able to. Uh, would, not, would have to comply with other uh, reporting obligations, whether it's to the IRS um, or their grant reporting obligations, for example, in addition to these disclosure requirements. Um, this would also be the case for organizations that may never even communicate with the city official because of the proposals around indirect lobbyists, um, which does not require any direct communication with a city official. So an organization that is letting community members know about a pending proposal and asking them to share their concern or support may have to establish these record keeping systems, file these two month reports, um, and register and pay a $450 fee. So we believe there would be a, a burden, especially on smaller organizations. Second, um, the point has been brought up that all organizations should be treated similarly, but we believe that similarly situated organizations should be treated similarly, and we believe that 51C3 organizations or not for a variety, variety of reasons. I just want to make a couple points. Um, the first is they're not typically advocating to directly benefit the organization. If that were the case, the exemption could say that it doesn't apply when an organization is seeking funding on its own behalf, for example. Second, federal tax law um, recognizes that these organizations are different. They're limited in how much lobbying they can do. They can't make campaign contributions under federal tax law. And the final point, and I'm out of time, um, it's not unprecedented. At least 10 jurisdictions have some type of 51c3 or nonprofit exemption. The city currently has a 51c3 exemption. We don't believe it strikes the right balance. The city of San Jose, the third largest and most populous city, 
completely exempt um, employees of 501c3 when they're when they're advocating on behalf of the organization. Sorry for going over time, but thanks again. Thank you. Ms. Hines. Yes, um, I just wanted to speak from an administrative standpoint on what kind of a burden this type of, of time frame, especially would, would put. Is you know the, we try very diligently to make sure that we report every single thing. So it takes me a good 10 to 15 days just to compile all the data I need to to put the report together. And we also have a cutoff period. So I want to make sure we're reporting all the checks that we've received and things. So it takes a good week just to make sure we've accounted for the mail delays and things of that nature. So as far as the 10 days, it's almost impossible to get the report accurate. And if the point is to get it accurate, we need the time to be able to do that. Um, also, I literally spend two weeks of my month at the end of each quarter reporting the city's report. So if we have to do it every two months, I mean, the, the staff burden, plus I can't imagine on the, the city staff as well. Um, as far as listing each of the city officials, that's even kind of difficult in a way. But if we had a, a template, possibly, that we could start from the quarter that we used the previous quarter and go in and make the changes we need to make, it would help. Uh, because right now, you have to start from scratch. So the state of California, for example, you can use last month's report and it pulls it up and you go in and make all the changes you want to make. So right now it's a, it's a very cumbersome process. Great, great website, but cumbersome. So that was the two comments that I wanted to make is the burden it would put on the administrative staff. That's very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for being here. All right. Uh, those are all of our comments on item number six. Um, I, <laughs> Mr. Charzan, I think you'll be spending a moment with us if you don't mind. Yes. Should be maybe a couple. Of moments. A couple of moments. I was I was just trying to get him up here, but yes. <laughs> um, so there are there are a number of. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I heard a couple of patterns and a few comments that I, I would love to hear a response and address it. So um, my thought is that I know we've all, well, I it looks like we've all poured over this, but perhaps a, a quick overview of what we've done without repeating what's in the report, sure. but kind of giving us a little background would be wonderful. And then, if you could specifically respond to a number of the comments we heard, and I do want to say we really do thank you for being here. Um, I know that everybody is busy and it takes a lot of time for you to come and park and give public comment, and um, we we take this seriously and we, we appreciate your time and your expertise and um, are endeavoring to make this as good as we possibly can. And, um, and you got a number of compliments, which is something we don't Appreciate we don't always see here. It's upside down day of the commission. <laughs> uh, so, to me, there were a number of comments that fell within the bucket of administrative burden, and particularly detailing the the contacts and the job title and the date. Um, I I would love to hear responses to that. Um, the private lawsuits and the type of behavior that that might incentivize. And then I will open this up. Um, the 10 day deadline, I think we heard about that a number of times. Um, but we can reporting about all titles, jobs, and dates. I think that was. It, it, it is ours the longest report in the state? I would love to know that as well. Um, so, okay, 10 day turnaround, um, five, the small 51C3s. Yeah, I am concerned about the pattern of comments we got about the administrative burden, um, about the private attorney.
attorneys and um, about the 10 day deadline and the, I, I remain, um, so Mr. Kurtz had brought up the issue of First Amendment and legal issues dealing with treating, well, I think there's a number of First Amendment issues. One, we could talk about some either 501c3s versus 501c3s, so big 501c3s versus small 501c3s. We could talk about everybody except 501c3s versus 501c3s. And then I think Mr. Kurtz was making a different point about potentially the chilling effect that this might cause in general. And so I certainly would like to hear either, and look, if the answer is we should do more thinking about the potential First Amendment concerns, that's completely fine with me. All right, so I will open this up to my fellow commissioners if they additionally have questions of you before we before we finally hear from you. And yes, drink all that water while you can. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I echo um, Commissioner Covington's concerns, and I think she's touched on all of the um, all of the issues. And I I enjoy the input of the administrative staff because they're the ones who have to put everything together and I am I'm concerned about a lot of different things I'm concerned about the 501c3 as I've discussed in previous um, meetings that I do participate in several 501c3s and we do do advocacy um, not in the city but on the state and federal level with regards to our issues um, and I have some questions about that but one thing I'm not familiar with as familiar with is the um, requirements as far as the 10 days of the administrative stuff. Um, I understand issues about getting the job titles. Um, personally, I'm not as concerned about that, but I am concerned about the 10 days being burdensome. And I understand how difficult it is to, to gather figures together and get reports out and get the reports from the different people so you can gather them. So that's one thing I am concerned about and am definitely willing to listen to um, any suggestions about flexibility as far as that deadline? Uh, I, I share all of the issues that have been pointed at, uh, pointed out here, and and uh, it, it does seem as if because of the numbers of people speaking, we have a lot of the comments on the administrative burdens and the uh, from the lobbyist uh, community. Uh, and then we do have the one on the 501C, but as you know from our prior meetings, it's not like as if this were our very first meeting. Um, we, we've spent a lot of time on that, and that obviously needs to be uh, addressed. The, the one policy concern that I heard for the first time was how these uh, changes will indeed incentivize people not to register and the complaints that there are so many currently unregistered uh, lobbyists. That is something obviously that we would be very concerned about across the board. Uh, is there the link that, that is uh, advocated here? And if there isn't that link, uh, please let us know. And how would we fix it if it, if it is? So I'll, I'll, I, I um, want to echo Commissioner Marie's um, sentiments about you know being involved in 501c3s and um, and what Mr. Subramanian said, treating similarly situated organizations similarly. Um, I do want to engage in that conversation a little bit more deeply, and I do think that that's separate than um, than the than than our, our lobbyists represented in the room. Uh, I heard the same thing as. Um, President Levinson, um, you know that that it seems particularly burdensome to be reporting all titles, jobs, dates. I thought Mr. Burgoff made a, a good point that you know I I worked in City Hall in 2007, and when I walked in today, I was like you know saying hi, high five in guards. Like you see so many people, and I can't tell you all of those people as I was walking on the way out. So I I can see how. You know, people who have been working here for 10 or 15 years, uh, how they might not remember, you know, when they get back to the office, who all those people are, um, and then, you know, shrinking the 10-day reporting period that um, that could seem like um, not only being burdensome for the administrative staff, 
in the lobbying firms, but also um, how it might affect uh, our, our our commission staff, um, and you know that might add to, to our, our burden. Um, I loved Ms. Hines' suggestion of a template for reporting. I don't know if that's a possibility, um, and and I want to echo Commissioner Orden's um, and and um, Mr. Green's idea about making sure that we're bringing in unregistered lobbyists from the fold rather than um, creating a chilling effect. Um, and I and I, I know, Mr. Um, Tarzai, that you have welcomed, and, and the commission as a whole has, have welcomed a lot of comments. Um, I, I like Mr. Sutton's idea of, of doing an interested persons meeting. I would, I would actually love to be present at that um, if, if we could do something like that. Yeah. Oh. Echo <laughs> um, everyone's sentiments. Um, I'll echo the gratitude for you for your hard work and your team um, efforts that started long before I was on this commission, just seeing my journey. Um, and I particularly want to thank everyone here who gave comments. I, I thought this was a very thoughtful um, engagement by the community, and, and um, specifically, uh, I hope I'll add some credence to, to the concept of, so I know from your report, the executive director's report, there's been a lot of work done in collaboration with the community to get input. Um, I heard today some really great ideas and some really thoughtful feedback um, to, to by people who, uh, and from a variety of, of the spectrum, who care about us focusing on the right issues. So I would, um, particularly um, second the concept of doing a series um, of working groups uh, um, in person, as was suggested, maybe not one, maybe a few, um, to, to really work with the community um, and, and hopefully a spectrum of opinions and voices will come to really ensure that we are focusing on the right um, types of issues and, and you know, in, in the context of being you know, with limited resources, are we focusing on the right um, issues that will really get to what we all care about, which is transparency and, and compliance. Um, and, and I will also second, and, and to, I'd love to hear from you too, whether besides what you've done, which I, I know is extensive to engage community, what other ideas do you have for what else we can do to, to partner with the community uh, across the spectrum of, of opinions? On, on this commission and this, this policy work. Um, and I'll, of course, uh, echo um, what uh, Alliance for Justice uh, brought to the table about, about the um, <coughs> role of C3s, 51C3s uh, in this community and what specific uh, attention uh, we can bring towards it, either as a separate working group for 51C3s or something to really, because they are such an important, I think you cited a, a report on the importance of, of C3s in the fabric of our community, so maybe some special attention is to be seen there as well. Thank you. I'll, I'll quickly correct, thank you, I'll quickly correct the record that Mr. Sutton was the one who brought up the First Amendment concerns. I think Mr. Gertz um, echoed them. Now that we potentially have a private right of attorney, I want to be very careful about what I say. So, um, thank you to all the commissioners for the really helpful comments. And Mr. Tars? Uh Thank you, President Robinson. Congratulations on your term here as president. Um, third term, I apologize. But I haven't been here in a while. So, um, I appreciate the comments. Second and a half. I'm still, I'm still a toddler. <laughs> Uh, I appreciate all the, the comments and questions. Um, uh, I agree, uh, President Levinson, I'll, I'll give a kind of quick overview, uh, and then we can kind of get into the details of your question, uh, every one of your questions. Um, for the record, my name is Armand Tarzi, Director of Policy, and I'm joined by my esteemed colleague, Mark Lowe, Lobby Program Manager, who of course all these registered lobbyists know very well. And uh, just to give you um, some general, uh, general sense of our laws, for over 50 years we have been regulated. Uh, it began in 1967 when we uh, started uh, requiring legis municipal legislative advocates to register and disclose activity. And in the 90s, uh, after the creation of the Ethics Commission, uh, the MLO became uh, effective. Um, of course, back then I was playing ASL soccer, but I'm going to leave that out of the equation. Uh, and the. What does it know? <laughs> and basketball. 
Um, we weren't you know, required. You're talking about all the sports you play. Everybody else is like, you know, I can't get off the elevator without people saying hi. I have no coordination and no friends in this <laughs> except for the four lobbyists who had to say that it's honorable commission. <laughs> it's, you know, it would be no problem for me to report everybody I see. Uh, for the record, President Levinson, I do consider you a friend. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so uh, in the 90s, the MLO became effective. Uh, required registration of lobbyists, lobbyist firms, and uh, disclosure of activities, uh, compensated activities, expenses, and political activities of each lobbying uh, entity and major filers. Um, our review is mandated by the charter. We have to periodically review our laws, keep them up to date. Uh, and uh, because of the need of, uh, of this update, due to new technologies that have that have come about since the 90s, quite frankly, uh, evolving native transparency, and to adopt the best practices we've studied and seen in other jurisdictions. Uh, we have engaged in many hours of staff discussions, and while I do appreciate the compliments I have received, this has definitely been a team effort and an agency effort. We have uh, reached across all disciplines for this, so it's definitely a team effort. Uh, and we also solicited input on multiple occasions from several thousand email subscribers. Uh, we reached out to all 96 neighborhood councils and the 1,500 board members of those councils. Uh, we have worked with the city attorney's uh, office for advice. We uh, reached out uh, to the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment uh, through their newsletter. They've also sought input. Uh, we've held, uh, since 2015, three interested persons meetings already. Uh, on this, uh, and we've also uh, had numerous one-on-one -on -one meetings, uh, and also we've had two, as uh, noted by Commissioner Orton, we've already had two commission meetings on this, uh, focusing on the meat, if you will, the definitions, uh, where we've received great input on those as well. Um, the item before you is based on a, an 18-month review. Uh, I know some of the comments made it seem like it was rushed somehow, but this has been a, an 18-month process. And the review was conducted on a, essentially the guiding principles that's, that are enumerated in the MLO. The, the ones I like to highlight are the public's right to know the identities of the interests that attempt to influence city decisions. All persons engaged in compensated lobbying should be subject to, to the same regulations. And that complete disclosure of the full range of lobbying activities and or financing is essential to maintain public confidence in government. Our proposals follow these guiding principles. For example, we propose more timely reporting, as mentioned in the comments, by adding two more reports a year and cutting down on the deadlines to file those disclosures, which we'll talk more in detail. We also propose disclosing contact officials and the data contact. This information is designed to give the public a better understanding as to who, or actually as to the level of lobbying that is occurring and at what phase of the process of the legislative process or the administrative decision making process the lobbying is really, the lobby, the lobbying is focusing on. In addition to that, we also propose reporting the position taken on a city matter. Uh, this is to enhance the public's awareness as to why a client uh, is engaging in lobbying activity. Uh, sometimes it's not clear by the, the client's name why they're lobbying or what side they stand on the, uh, the issue. And we also propose registration and continuous reporting by all entities. Uh, all lobbying entities, whether it's a whether it's a lobbyist, whether it's a firm, an organization, or a uh, indirect lobbyist, they should all be treated equally when it comes to filing and registering. These recommendations are our best assessment. Uh, based off our best assessment, we've had, uh, as we've said, multiple uh, commission meetings on this. And I want to note that this is a a continuation of this of the conversation. This is a continuation of all the work we've done. Uh, we have, uh, you know, pr provided language in attachment D of the memo. If the commission wishes to approve some of the proposals or all, that's of course uh, the decision of the commission. We provided that information for you as well. Um, but as with all policy items, it is an action item for that reason to give you that kind of flexibility. Um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any specific questions on this concept. What's the, sorry, Commissioner Morgan? Well, uh, I think uh, maybe just the very, uh, very first uh, question of uh, the need for, what's the underlying problem? What's the need for the two more reports? And uh, how do you think 
people to deal with the 10 day uh, deadline. I must admit I come from the legal side. I'm very used to doing my um, timesheets supposedly every day and the pain when I don't do it every day. Uh, and so I have worked with the administrative staff about that occasionally when I have not done that. Um, so, so I know for especially entities and uh, larger groups, it actually is internally best practices to do that kind of thing. Uh, but I don't think I ever had to you know, put down everybody I said hello to in the hall, and I did know some of the people in the hall. Mm -hmm. So uh, sure. tell us, just focus on what the problem is and why you think that that burden, which it is, is overweighed by what we get from it. Sure, uh, thank you. Uh, I think it's important to put in uh, in context this conversation with what's currently required in our laws and laws. Uh, I'll give you an example. Let's say uh, it's October, first week or two of October, well, October 15th, uh, a lobbyist, registered lobbyist, comes into City Hall and they are attempting to influence a city official on a matter. Under our current law, that activity that happened on October 15th would not have to be reported until the end of January. So we would go four months, we would pass Halloween, Thanksgiving, <laughs> the holidays and New Year's, we would pass all these holidays, and four months after, nearly four months after the fact, the public would then see the lobbying activity as it is right now. Staff feels that that's not uh, the best type or timely disclosure for the public to know what's going on. I mean, in a four month period, you can have a legislative matter or definitely an administrative matter start and complete within that time frame without the public ever actually knowing what's going on. So that's the that's where we first came from. We saw a current issue with our current uh, current uh, timeline. Since then, we've studied other jurisdictions. We've seen, we've, we've contacted them, we've seen what works. And there are several examples of jurisdictions that require monthly reports. Uh, City of New York, the only jurisdiction larger than us, require a bi-monthly report. Uh, Denver, a smaller city, but large, uh, a large metropolitan, they also require a bi-monthly report. So staff settled on, on a bi-monthly report as a good in-between, kind of giving uh, the regular community some time. When it comes to the deadline, uh, we have looked at, uh, again, there's no perfect science here. <laughs> there's no uh, perfect formula. So a lot of times you're gonna hear me say, uh, comparing ourselves to uh, other similar situated cities because we've already seen what works, kind of you know, the power of emulation, seeing what works. So when we see other cities, for example, San Francisco, who has a monthly report and is requiring 15 day, uh, has a 15 day deadline, uh, we see that the 10 day deadline that we're proposing kind of falls in line with what other cities in similar situations are reporting. Uh, and that's kind of where we, that's how we ended up. So, uh, I'm thinking about something, again, Mr. Burgoff said, which was, you know, operating from a place that lobbyists are doing something wrong. And um, all of the people in this room who have come and given public comment today are clearly paying attention. So I guess my question is, if they're all already reporting every four months, are they the people doing something wrong? Or, I mean, it is, is the effect of, of something like this with a shorter time period going to be, as Mr. Green pointed out, you know, that we're creating more of a chilling effect and it's, Fewer and fewer people are registering as lobbyists because um, if, if so many people are reporting, my assumption is that they're trying to do things right. So I guess I'm wondering how do we how do we help them do more things right, right, and not create more hurdles. I want to make it very clear on the record: there is nothing wrong. <laughs> with lobbying, with lobbying. Okay. Uh, and I appreciate that concern. I think it's important just as that argument was made in the public comments to understand the other side of the argument. Increase transparency, increase understanding of the activity that's happening in City Hall or with the city can only increase the legitimacy of lobbying activity, of, of well-conducted, uh, uh, good conduct in lobbying activity. It's only gonna increase 
the public understanding of what's going on. And hopefully, will if, if there is wrongdoing, we'll shed a light on that. But increased transparency, and this is a, a, common, a common principle, will only further legitimize the logging field. And it is a legitimate activity. Uh, it does educate public officials. There's nothing, these laws are not saying that anything's wrong with that. It's just an increased level of transparency, which further legitimizes legitimizes uh, legitimizes. When it comes to the, the a potential chilling effect, um, you know, we do uh, plan on having a robust outreach program. You know, we do hope to educate everyone on these new regulations and the bi-monthly reporting once it comes into play. I haven't heard from the other jurisdictions that this has had a chilling effect. I haven't heard, and this is just from my research, I haven't heard uh, of you know a monthly or bi-monthly jurisdiction who has seen lobbyists who should register say, well, I'm not going to register because they're not quarterly; it's bi-monthly or monthly. I haven't heard of that. Um, uh, so, but I understand the concern, and you know this comes from a place guided by our principles, guided by evidence we've seen in other jurisdictions, and what's best for Los Angeles. Did you hear from any of um, people who have given written comment or during the outreach of a more uh, or a less burdensome time period for reporting? Uh, I believe, uh, I'm sorry, we got a lot of comments. So yeah, I believe sure. the only one I do recall is just keeping it the same essentially mm -hmm. every quarter or the month after the quarter uh, mm -hmm. the reporting period. Uh, uh -huh. yeah, how much do you think the, the now we are in the electronic age and, the, and I know we're increasing drop down uh, uh, ability on, on many ways it's with some of what has been uh, mentioned here and I thought it was an excellent comment from uh, uh, an administrator who actually does this for a living uh, that we could so design the website so that it makes it even uh, more user friendly? I'm definitely not a tech guy. <laughs> Certainly, I think, yeah. I think our, uh, our IT person always, if anything, is strongly possible. I don't know if Mr. Lowe wants to add anything to that. Good morning, yeah. Commissioners. For the record, I'm Mark Lowe. I'm the Loving Program Manager. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of history. Since 2003, the Ethics Commission created a lobbyist electronic filing system, and it has become the hallmark for many jurisdictions that had it in there or actually buy the system from us. And it is always under constant review and refinement. We have a great um, IT manager by the name of Tim Grant, who you may see here sometimes, but you don't really get the opportunity to talk to him. But he's been very willing and able to, as we suggest um, refinements and amendments to the system, he works tirelessly to implement those. And again, I'm not a, I also, like Armin, am not a programming person, but um, if we suggest that there are ways to perhaps refine the information such to relieve the burden on the people who are filing by uh, implementing drop-down menus with pre preset uh, information, and he will all, um, very much to his abilities try to do that. Before I go on, I would like to thank the regulated community, especially those people like Donna Hines of Englander, Kanabe and Allen, Matt Nichols of Liner LLP, and uh, Curtis Sanchez of Africa Consulting Group, who did submit their public comment to talk about, you know, what, um, how much work it does require them to be compliant. They are among some very much willing to comply individuals that I work with every reporting period. Uh, I know that they are willing to do their best in doing that. So I very much appreciate their comments in, in saying that you know it might be burdensome and, and, and it might require us to take a look at um, their consideration of all of this. So like when we felt, no, go ahead. Good morning, Heather Holt, Executive Director. <clears throat> Excuse me. I just wanted to add two things with regard to the technology. One is I heard a suggestion about pre-populating reports so that- um, Like our it, form 700. Yes, yeah. and so we already have a, a model for that in place with our other electronic filing systems, and that's something that can easily be done, which would alleviate some of the burden. In addition, the system is designed so that information can be entered on a daily basis, if that were so desired, so that um, it doesn't become two weeks of crunch um, at the end of the reporting period in order to get all data entered. 
Uh, one, one other thing I'd like to add on top of that, uh, with regard to the pre-population of information, we already do that regarding certain information that's in the system, um, with regard to registrations that carry over for, from year to year for the same clients. The, all the, all the uh, filer has to do is select that information from, oh, I had this client last year and we'll pre-populate all that information. So there is um, you know, some basis for that perhaps to happen with new regulations. Hopefully we can do that with um, the programming that's necessary for anything new that we propose and approve. I had a question. Um, trying to, I don't want to change the subject, but um, I had a question and, and um, Mr. Lowe or Mr. Tarby one of you can answer it um, with regards to the job titles currently what information is elicited as far as the contacts is it the person and who they represent and who they work for as, as far as the city hall um, with regard to the current ordinance uh, the current law um, what's required at the end of the reporting period is the lobbyist reports the agencies that they reached out to on behalf of which clients and that's the extent of it. But they don't report, yeah, I met with Councilman so-and-so and his administrative assistant or his um, secretary at the front desk or something. I mean, that's not. Correct, correct, that, that's correct. It, it doesn't go to that level where anybody's name or position is requested by our, our form. One thing I, I do want to point out, and I don't know that anybody has made this distinction, with regard to what we're proposing, um, we're not looking for every person that a lobbyist said hello to when they come into City Hall. We're specifically looking to contacts that are related to attempts to influence on behalf of their clients. So we just want to be sure that, you know, they're not, and it would be ridiculous for us to, to um, require someone to say, how many people did you say hello to in City Hall, or who did you run into in the elevator? We're not looking for that, those type of interactions, you know. Attempts to influence sounds like the people in the room would want to err on the side of caution. So I, I'll say two things and then we've been going for an hour, so let's take a, a five minute uh, break. But one, I wanna echo what was said, which is the people who bothered to come, it strikes me that if you bother to come here and show up, it's because you want to comply with the rules. And please don't feel from us, we think, I mean, the building's not on fire and there's a ton of lobbyists in the room, so we don't think there's anything wrong with what we do. And we appreciate that, um, look, if you complain about the administrative burden, it means you plan on complying regardless of what it is. If you don't really have the idea that you're gonna comply, you're not gonna complain about rule changes. So we're very thankful for that. Um, I will say that you're not privy to the view that we're privy to, which is people kind of having nonverbal feedback to what you're saying. So I think we may be at the moment where it's really useful for us to have this conversation and then maybe to continue it um, after we can, after we get even more feedback. And it does sound like you've done an enormous amount of outreach already. So it is uh, 1033, let's come back at 1038.